welcome to First United Methodist Church. I'm glad you're all here today. Thank you for coming. To those who hated and feared Jesus, his death was the end of the threat to their power, the end of the silly notion that this meek, humble man could be the long-awaited Messiah. It was proof that they had won. If death on the cross had been the end, Jesus would have disappeared from our world over time. But death was not the end. Do you have an announcement? Thank you, everyone. Our call to worship today is from Psalm 34, verse 8. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Pray with me. We come to church hungry, Lord. We are hungry for comfort, hungry for love, hungry for a new way of living, hungry for your word. Thank you for giving us this place, this time to worship. And we are eager to taste your goodness in community with our brothers and sisters. Please rise for our song.
us our thoughts on our prayers today. We are glad uh, you are here and worshiping with us again. Thanks again for your warm welcome to Irene and to me. I'm on my fourth Sunday with you now. I have one in June and five in July. Only two left after this one. I'm going to miss you guys already. I'm glad we're here. But you're doing a wonderful job getting ready for the Niles family. I know the wonderful effort, as you heard from your trustees, that you're doing in everyone. And uh, that is my purpose, too, to create that wonderful atmosphere that you already have here and that welcoming. But thanks for coming today and for worshiping God. As we lift our prayers to God, we know in our hearts those who are in need, either at home or in our hospitals or nursing homes. I had that privilege of taking communion to three of our nursing home residents this past week, and Mary Jane went with me, and we had a great time. It's a wonderful connection of love when we care for each other and we share each other's faith. But let us be now in the spirit of prayer. Father, you have walked with us to this place of worship. By your Spirit, you have brought us here. Help us to know because he lives, we can face today and tomorrow and all the days to come. Be with those who are in our homes or in our hospitals who are facing illness, those who are struggling, O oh Lord, with pain. Help us to know that you are the one who comes to relieve it and give strength. Be with those who are in need today. We have a specific mention of Eugene's mom's uncle Chris who passed away Friday night. For Shelly who has a lung infection. For those who are in our hospital or recuperating, we know you walk with them because you are the great healer, the great helper, and the great physician. Be with those who are in the service of our nation, the men and women who are in harm's way for our freedom. Be with them and their families. Be with those, O oh Lord, who are witnesses to you in the world through missionary effort. Thank you for this church that lives not only by breathing inward in its faith, but outward in its mission. We pray for the Niles family as they prepare to come to begin their ministry here. May the love of Christ and the purpose of all of our lives together in being your witnesses be with each one of us as we begin that new journey. Guide us now, O oh Lord, to be your people, to realize that we are your hands, your eyes, your feet upon this earth. Thank you for our loved ones, the ones perhaps very closest to us this morning, who we often take for granted. Help us to know what a gift they are to us. And help us to know that Christ went all the way to the cross for each of us, how personal that is, and how in his powerful resurrection we know we have a circle that is unbroken in eternity. We pray your blessing upon this wonderful congregation. To guide us to be your people. For we ask it in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. All the kids, come and join me for children's time. being in our life. And I know you guys come to church and you go to children's church and you come to BBS and we do all the events. So God's probably like the most important thing in your life, right? You always put him first and nothing else comes first, right? Right? Yeah! But sometimes in life things do come first. Like sometimes we put our friends first. And sometimes we put school first. Sometimes we put driving our parents crazy first. Yeah, I love you. 
And sometimes we get so worried about what we're doing that we forget to put God first. And our life is pretty full, and then we try and jam him in there just when we need him. But it doesn't fit that way. So what we have to do is put God first. And then put our friends, put our school, put our life, and everything fits just right. Okay? When you put God first, he makes sure that all the other stuff in your life fits the way it should. Okay? So that's what we have to try and remember. Sometimes it's hard when we're with our friends or when we want to, our parents said we couldn't go to our friend's house and you can't have a sleepover and you're angry and you say something. And when you drive your mother crazy. (laughs) And sometimes it's hard because we want to say mean things and we want to be mean. And we have to remember, we got to do what God wants and put him first. And then he'll make sure everything else we need fits in our life. Okay? We are going to say a prayer. Can you guys hold your hands? Okay. And say, Dear God, thank you for all that you do for me. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me when I forget to put you first. And thank you for keeping me safe. I will try harder to put you first. I love you, God. Amen. You may be seated. The passage of scripture I'm preaching on today is happens to be one of my favorites because it's a wonderful example of how Paul tells us what to hold on to in life, and that's the example of Jesus Christ. In these 11 verses, he talks about how Jesus, even though he was fully God, became fully human for us and to give us the example of how to live. That's why it's such a powerful passage that we read and share this day before Almighty God from Philippians, the second chapter. And I'm going to be reading to you the first 11 verses. Your life in Christ makes you strong, and his love comforts you. You have fellowship with the Spirit, and you have kindness and compassion for one another. I urge you then to make me completely happy by having the same thoughts, sharing the same love, being one in soul and mind. Don't do anything from selfish ambition or from cheap desire to boast, but be humble towards one another, always considering others better than yourselves. And look out for one another's interests, not just for your own. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force that he should try to become equal to God. Instead of this, of his free own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became, became like man and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and he walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on a cross. And for this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven and on earth and all the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord and the glory of God the Father. Let us bow together for a moment of prayer. Dear Lord, help us now to know that you have a message for each one of us, a message of love, of humility, and of caring, of example in our lives of what to follow if we follow our Savior, our Redeemer, and our Lord. Thank you for that great love. Help us to know in this world that is so often challenging of what to hold on to, 
and what to let go of. It is so important. It will, O oh Lord, define our lives. Guide us now to be your people. Surround us by your love. May it be special. May it be real. May it be true. In your blessed name we pray. Amen. Remember a couple of weeks ago I told you how I like country western music, remember? Yeah. A friend of mine who knows I have a doctorate used to say to me, you have all those years of education and you like country western music? I said, of course, they tell stories, right? Aren't, don't they? Yes. Remember some of my favorite country western songs? I shared the titles with you. Here's a couple others that I thought are interesting because they tell a story. First of all, Mama get the hammer. There's a fly in the baby's head. How about that one? <laughs> or I like bananas. I like eating bananas. This is actually the title of a song. I like eating bananas because they have no bones. How about that? Huh? A man wrote a country western song about his cow once. It was entitled, She Was Bitten on the Udder by the Adder. How about that? <laughs> and then the one I told you about a little long, a little while ago, the one that says, you know, my best friend ran away with my wife, and I sure do miss him. Remember that one? <laughs> Guess where I'm going this afternoon? To the Willie Nelson concert. <laughs> Willie's going to sing some songs, isn't he? I hope he sings on the road again. You were always on my mind. And that special one for Dr. Hall, whiskey for my men, beer for my horses. <laughs> it's going to be a time in which he's going to tell stories. And today I want to tell you the story of why Paul wrote these words. The Philippians were struggling about what to hold on to in life. They come to a point where they had been arguing with each other of what the core of the faith was. And so he wrote these 11 verses that tell them what Jesus really was like. That even though he was fully God, he became a human being for each of us. And that love and that power and that strength is now before us. We choose who we follow in life. And we choose what to hold on to and what to let go of. You know, I know nearly every family I know has someone who's a saver and someone who's a throw away. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I may get close to truth here. <laughs> In my family, I'm the saver. My wife, I means to throw her out, which is good. <laughs> Same with my parents, they were like that, although my parents were more both savers. But there's always those choices you make, isn't it, about what to hold on to and what to throw away. And in life, there is this message. It is so important that we choose to hold on to that thing which is eternal, and that's our soul. It's our most valuable possession, I want you to know. My favorite country song is one that drives this home for me. The singer Kenny Rogers years ago had his biggest hit. It was entitled The Gambler, do you remember? It's about an aging, dying gambler who's on a train late at night, midnight, and there's a young man sitting across from him. And the young man asks the gambler for advice about life. And the gambler begins to tell him, using the example of a hand of cards. Remember what he says? The key line in the whole song. The secret to surviving is knowing what to throw away and knowing what to keep. And it's so true. When you choose God and the soul first, then your life is defined. You're then not only a child of God, you're his witness in this world. A Christ-centered person, Paul said, is always humble before they are prideful. 
there is some things that it's good to have pride in because you should have pride in good things, but lots of times pride leads us away from God. He says Jesus was always humble. He was always trying to be the other person, so he understood what a mile in their shoes were like. Hold on to humility. Hold on to the fact that God wants you to look at others with the same value as God looks upon you. Hold on in life to those things that hold you close to him and close to one another. Don't let them go. The secret to survive is knowing what to throw away and knowing what to keep. It's a wonderful story I love. Are you surprised by that? <laughs> it's about an agnostic that fell off a cliff. Now remember there's a difference between an agnostic and an atheist. An atheist says, I don't believe in God, period. There is no God. An agnostic says, I just don't know. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Often indifferent. Well, an agnostic fell off a cliff. Halfway down, he caught hold of a bush that was sticking out of the mountain he was on. There hanging momentarily, saving his life. Still so far from the ground, he shouldn't let go. And he began, this agnostic, to pray. He said, is there anybody up there? And a voice answered, yes, this is the Lord. The man yells frantically, help me, help me, Lord. There's a moment of silence, and the Lord answers, let go of the bush, and I will save you. There's another long silence, and the man looks down at the ground far below, and then he finally yells out, Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> too often we don't want to trust God, do we? Too often we're hanging there, and we haven't chose to hold on to Christ. I want you to hold on to him through this wonderful transition you're going to be going to, about a Christ who knew how to love who knew how to bring us through transitions in life, but knew how to trust him to let go of the bush. As I told you before, we have a God and Jesus who said these things. You're going to be surprised. The first will be last, and the last will be first. The wise people will actually be foolish, and those who seem foolish will be the wise ones. The apparent losers in life will be the winners, and the winners will be the losers. And then he said, there are people with eyes that really cannot see, and those who are blind, who are actually visionary. He looked at some people and saw that they were alive physically, but dead spiritually. And he always said, what it comes back to is, who do you value? What do you hold on to? Do you hold on to me? Or do you hold on to the world and the power of what the world tells us to do? We are so worried about what other people think of us. We're all that way. It's natural. I always love that story of the 102-year-old man that was interviewed in a nursing home about the advantages of being 102. He looked at the reporter and he said, the advantages of being 102... No peer pressure. <laughs> Too often we worry about what someone else thinks. That's why I love country western. They tell usually that unvarnished truth. They tell us to hold on to humility, to forgive, and to throw away the regrets and the grudges of our lives. And this is so important that I've learned in 44 years in the ministry. I've seen people live their entire lives in regret for one thing that they made a mistake on years ago and they never overcame it. It drained the vitality out of their lives. I tell you now, if you regret something, a difficult decision, a mistake you might have made, the greatest gift of forgiveness is right before us in Jesus Christ. The scriptures say he, not, this is hard to imagine, but it's wonderful. It, the scriptures say over and over again, especially in the Psalms, God not only forgives our sin, but he forgets them. If he forgave and forgot, how about us? We're our own harshest judges. 
Hold on to forgiveness. And humility is what Jesus was all about. He forgave those who took him to the cross. Somehow we need to know those are the things that God's calling us to today. The secret to surviving is knowing what to throw away and knowing what to keep. If you have a grudge against somebody, and this is not an easy thing, I know. People hurt us along the way in life. Years ago in my first church, I knew two sisters who, after their 20s, never talked to each other for 60 plus years. I remember talking to both of them because they were both connected with the church. And you know what? They could barely remember what it was that divided them. And yet they held a grudge. I think at the end, at least one of them gave it up. Forgive, forget, throw away the regrets and the grudges. Then you're going to follow Jesus. You're going to know what's important in your life. Step up. And they had in the newspaper the other day, lost dog, lost one dog, brown hair, several bald, bald spots in his head, right leg broken in an auto accident, left hip hurt and dislocated, right eye missing, left ear bitten off in a dog fight, answers to the name of a lucky. <laughs> That's positive, right? It's what we need to look at in life. Whatever you're facing, Jesus always told you never to give up. The great Winston Churchill, they say, gave the greatest speech of his life during the war. He was at Cambridge and speaking to young men who were about to go. He got up and he preached a sermon, you might say, a speech of nine words. These are the words. Never give up, never give up, never give up. And then he sat down. Pretty good speech, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in the deep and dark moments of life. He knew what to do, and that's what Jesus did. He was humble, he was forgiving. He told us to give up the grudges and the regrets. And most of all, he told mm -hmm. us to trust him. To trust him deeply. And trust him to give the gifts that he gives to each of us. You know the great, and he was great, the greatest celloist of all the world, Pablo Casals, died at almost 100 years of age. It was in just a few weeks of being 100. The morning Pablo Casals died, you know what he was doing? They found him downstairs in his home with his cello practicing his notes at 6 a.m. Can you imagine the best in the world still knew what the gift was that God gave him? And he used to say this, that when he practiced his notes, the basic notes at 6 a.m. every morning, he thanked God for the gift. It isn't lovely when we find out what is the most valuable thing that God has given us, and that is our souls. I want you to know that today, how valuable you are. You've heard this from me before. You ought to go from here a little lighter in your step, a little more positive in your outlook, because the God who loves us cares for us each day. And Paul gave the Philippians that great example of humility and forgiveness and trust. And if you do that, that's what to hold on to. Secret to survive. Knowing what to throw away and knowing what to keep. Years ago, a man that I respect very much gave me a column from the Kansas City Times. It was written by Robert Folgem. And he told me, and he was an educated man, even beyond the doctorate that I have, he had other degrees even beyond that. But he said in the end, remember, what you hold on to is the simple things, not the complicated things. 
and he gave me this column by Robert Fulton entitled, All I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. I give it to you today as a gift of what to hold on to in your faith. Most of what I really needed to know about how to live, what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain. I've learned this. But it was there in the sandbox at nursery school. These are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt someone. Wash your hands before you eat. This is an important one. Flush. Flush. <laughs> I like this one too. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some, think some, draw some, paint some, sing and dance and play and work some every day. You teachers know this when you teach them. And I love teachers. My wife is one. Take a nap every afternoon. <laughs> when you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands. Stick together. Be aware of wonder. Remember the little seed in the plastic cup? The roots go down and the plant goes up. And nobody really knows how or why, but we're all like that. Goldfish and hamsters and white mice, even the little seed in the plastic cup, they all die. And so someday will we. Remember that first book you read, Dick and Jane, remember? <laughs> and the word, the first word you learned in that book was look, L-O-O-K. Everything you need to know is in there somewhere. The golden rule. Love and basic sanitation, ecology, and politics, and saint living. So think what a better world it would be if all of us, the whole world, had cookies and milk about 3 o'clock every afternoon, and then laid down on our blankets for a nap. Or if we had a basic policy in every nation and every other nation, to always put back things where we found them and to clean up our own messes. And still it is true forever, no matter how old you are, when you go out into the world, it is best to hold hands, to stick together, and to trust God. Not a bad thing to hold on to, right? secret to surviving is knowing what to throw away and knowing what to keep. And Jesus said those things are humility, forgiveness, and trust. Not a bad thing to carry with you in a challenging world. So I'll say hello to Willie for you this afternoon, okay? <laughs> You're always on my mind. Let us pray. Dear Lord, it is hard sometimes in life to know what to throw away. <clears throat> sometimes we don't throw away things that hurt us, like regrets and grudges. Sometimes the hardest thing in life is knowing what to hold on to. Too often we've thrown those things away. But today we know what Paul wanted the Philippians to know. Follow the example of Jesus. Look what he was like. The first will be last, and the last will be first, and the foolish will be wise, and the wise will be foolish. The ones who can see will be blind, and the blind will see. Well, I thank God today for this great church, for the people of it, the way they welcome people, the way they care for people. 
because they do it in the name of the one who made the blind see and the lame walk and the deaf hear. The same Jesus Christ yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, Lord, that you gave them to us and that we're holding on to our souls today. And that is very good. In your name we pray. Amen.